All right, we will go ahead and get this started. It is 10.30. Um, good morning, everyone, and I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be a part of this year's first Tennessee Sustainable Spirits webinar uh, entitled Sustainability and Clean in Place Techniques. Uh, this webinar is being put on by the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program in collaboration with, Oliver, you might have to help me with this, Z. Leffler, Z. Leffler. Leffler is a German name. I knew you would be a lot better at it than, than, I, than I am. So, uh, and they also are a member of the Vincent Group. Um, my name is Caleb Powell, and I'm an environmental scientist for the Office of Sustainable Practices at TDEC, um, which is the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. And I'll be hosting the webinar today for our wonderful speakers. Um, as you may have noticed, uh, everyone is muted upon entry to reduce the amount of background noise. Uh, but if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to ask those in the chat box and I'll work on um, asking those at the end of the presentations. And we really do hope that you um, have some questions for us. That's, that's the whole um, reason for doing these webinars is to, to be able to give some great information and then also answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so uh, what I'm doing right now is I'll go ahead and send um, a message to everyone in the chat box. It should be over on your right-hand side. Um, so I sent, should have shown where the chat box is. If you're having any issues with audio, uh, video, or the slides, um, you can send that chat to, to, to me. Um, there's a drop down that says all participants, um, all panelists. Just either make sure that you, you've got like the host uh, or all participants or all panelists put in there if you have a, um, a question because I want that, those questions to come to me so that I can um, make sure to ask those uh, to our speakers um, at the end of the, of the presentation. So um, you can also raise your hand with a little hand emoji that's right there above the chat box um, if you would rather uh, ask your questions in person um, rather than me asking them for you. Um, if there's a little bit more to the question that you might have, feel free to just put your put your hand up, your virtual hand up, and I can unmute you and, and we can start that conversation. Um, to give an overview of what's going to be covered today, um, like was mentioned, this is the first of our two webinars for the year for the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program. Uh, we'll start off the webinar by covering what the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program is uh, from our um, uh, the, the program manager, Mark Valencia. Uh, and then this webinar will then discuss how spirit producers can enhance facility sustainability through clean in place practices. Uh, attendees will learn more about how spirits producers can clean equipment in a manner that can reduce operational costs associated with water consumption, chemical use, and energy consumption. Um, our presenter has a wealth of knowledge and experience that will help us better understand um, these efficient cleaning techniques uh, in the spirit industry. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Mark Valencia. Mark is a, an environmental scientist in the office with myself, um, TEDx Office of Sustainable Practices, um, and he's also the program manager for our Tennessee Sustainable Spirits program. So he's the, the mastermind behind this program, and he's going to talk a little bit now about the program and uh, just how it can help sp spirit producers here in the state. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Again, I'm Mark Valencia. I'm with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Uh, I'm part of a, a, a group. Uh, right now, we're considered the Office of Sustainable Practices. Our name may change, but we still do the same uh, great work. Uh, we, I want to emphasize from the bat, uh, I do work with, I do work in the Department of Environment and Conservation but I am in an office that is not, not part of the regulatory uh, or compliance uh, part, portion of TDEX. So everything I do, I like to say I'm not in the business of telling anyone what to do. I'm in the business of helping people go above and beyond uh, regulatory compliance. So a quick little overview of some of the things that we do within our office, and our office just emerged uh, with small business environmental assistance, and that is also a, another non-regulated entity and I would like to emphasize that if you are a small business and you're ever interested or have any questions with regulatory compliance, uh, our team members with a small business can help provide free confidential uh, technical assistance with any of those matters for you. Some of the other things that we do, uh, we, we are kind of broken up into several different teams. So if you look on the left, the business team is where the Tennessee uh, Sustainable Spirits Program is housed. Uh, you know, that's mainly focused on businesses. We have another program called the Green Star Partnership which is similar to Sustainable Spirits, but it's mainly designed for large industrial organizations. So, you know, your GMs, your uh, 
tire manufacturers, organizations like that, that want to go above and beyond regulatory compliance, we also, you know, recognize those people as well. The, material, material, the Tennessee Materials Marketplace, which I think would be helpful in this industry as well, we like to call it the dating app for materials and byproducts. So if you're a manufacturer and you have some sort of byproduct and you don't have a beneficial use for it, maybe you can post it through this marketplace and help other organizations find this and use this for whatever purposes they could do. On the community side, we cover a lot of different things, usually uh, educational and household, residential uh, type of work. So, you know, we have our unwanted household uh, pharmaceutical take back program, Tire Environmental Act, uh, a lot of education uh, organizations that we work with, so K through 12 and even higher ed. On um, the state government side, that's where we do a lot of work internally, trying to improve sustainability in state government. Uh, this is a quick little overview of a uh, quick little uh, description. I'll just read it real quick. Tennessee Sustainable Spirits is a voluntary program that assists wineries and wine growers, breweries and distilleries in increasing sustainability by promoting best practices, providing technical assistance, and developing relationships. So uh, this is a free membership program for any brewery, winery, or distillery in the state of Tennessee. Um, benefits of becoming a member to this program, uh, you get this unique branding. So if you look on the right, that is a unique logo that we've designed specifically for our members. So this is a, a logo that any uh, member to the program could probably display on any of their products, on their storefronts. We give you window cleans and a couple of other promotional materials to promote this logo. And we encourage the public to look for this logo throughout the state. We recognize all our members on our website. We have an interactive map that shows where all of our members are located with their address uh, and some, you know, unique information on how they are sustainable. You, we do articles from time to time on new members. Uh, we, and usually anytime we have a new member, um, every year we do a press release of all our new members. And this press release usually gets picked up by local media, sometimes nationwide media. I know we have the Weather Channel. Uh, they have a sustainability segment pick up on this before. And most of our members have been featured in local news articles when they become new members. Uh, we provide free technical assistance. So, you know, be, the benefit of becoming one of our members, we provide a sustainability report after you become a member. In this report, we provide, you know, some uh, recommendations on to, to go even further. These, again, are recommendations. You don't have to do anything with them, but if you would love to pursue them, we can provide some of that legwork for you. We can get some of that initial technical assistance to figure out how you can uh, incorporate some of those. Or if you have any sustainability questions, we can provide some of that technical assistance for you as well. Like I mentioned, the new members get uh, recognized. We usually have an event every year. And we have a vast uh, list of resources on our website, not only for producers, but we've developed a, uh, a list of resources for home brewers and even um, citizens of the state who are looking for sustainable producers and what to look for in sustainable producers. We've provided some of that um, resources for consumers. This is just an example of some of the promotional items that we, we've developed. So that middle <clears throat> item in the picture, those are window cleans to put on your storefront to let people know that you're a member of the program. Uh, the bottom left, those are bottle hangers that you can hang over, you know, a beer bottle, whiskey bottle, wine bottle, displaying that you're a member. And the unique thing with those bottle hangers, they are actually printed on a, a type of paper that's embedded with a local wildflower seed. So whenever you're done with that bottle hanger, you can actually plant it in the soil and it'll grow uh, native plants in your in your yard or garden. The bottom right are coasters that are actually made of um, recycled tire rubber. So these are actually taking tires that were destined to be, you know, destroyed or go to a landfill and it's been reused and repurposed into, into these really nice looking um, coasters. So membership, there's uh, uh, several items that we cover with becoming a member and um, what we're trying to focus on is the environment as a whole. So we, we like to address water conservation, uh, air and water pollution, uh, you know, increasing waste reduction. So we don't want to see as much stuff going to uh, landfills and things like that. And expanded community involvement. I think uh, being part of the community you're in is very uh, important as, as being a good steward to the environment and your community. But it's also important including the community with some of the sustainability efforts that you're doing as well. Application process, it's, uh, it's very quick and easy. It's streamlined. 
we like to, to keep it uh, focused and, and not too robust, but there are some asks that we have. So to become a member, you have to submit an application, and that is a one-page, quick, just brief, uh, you know, your name, your address, things like that, what, what you produce. Uh, you have to submit utility data and production data for the past year. This is important for us because we want to establish a baseline to show you, you know, how much, how many gallons of water it takes to produce, you know, one gallon of beer or how many kilowatt hours it takes to produce, you know, a one gallon of beer. And then we take this data and we can compare it to national and international averages to show you where you stand nationally and internationally. This is a great way to establish a baseline see how you stand up to other producers, and sometimes we can break it down to size. And it, if anything, it helps you look at your overhead. And what we do with that is with the hope of reducing that, that uh, ratio every year. Um, you submit a checklist, so it's the application, your utility data, and production data, and a checklist. So the checklist is on our website, and I'll, I'll go over in the next few slides, but there are 49 elements to this checklist, and it covers everything, you know, water, air, uh, waste, community involvement, and it's designed to get you there. And if we, if you're not there, I can guarantee we can get you there in a few extra steps and changes to your process, which are very minimally invasive. And so you have to meet a minimum of 25 of the elements listed on that 49 checklist. <clears throat> Once we get all that information, <clears throat> we will review your application, we'll review your data, and we'll review your checklist. During that time, TDEC will have an internal compliance. So being that we are still part of TDEC, it is in our best interest to make sure that you're in compliance or if you're having any regulatory issues. Um, and if you are, if we do notice that you have some compliance issues, you may not become a member right now, but we can also work with you or get you into contact with our small business team to get you back into compliance. So it, it's not an end all be all. Once you get back into compliance, you can reapply and become a member. Uh, once we go through those steps, you know, we'll do an on-site visit after we review all that information. And what we're doing on this on-site visit is just verifying the things that you checked in your checklist and also identifying areas of opportunity to list in our sustainability report. So after that walkthrough and we review all that data, we'll compile it all. We'll develop a very robust sustainability report listing the things that you're doing great. We'll list uh, your energy use ratio, your water use ratio. And then we'll also uh, provide recommendations. And again, these recommendations will come with some examples and, and you know, see how other uh, organizations have achieved those recommendations. But again, they're up to you. You don't have to follow any of them. They're just recommendations. Once you get that report, we'll also send you, you know, a formal letter uh, accepting you into the program. So this is the checklist. <clears throat> There's four pages to it. And if you look closely, it's broken down to different categories. So here you can see water, air and waste. So all these items on there are just things that you can check off sh uh, showing that you're doing these. So check off the ones that you're doing. And if you don't know if you, if you are or not, you can always just, you know, circle it, talk to me, we can help verify. One thing I do want to uh, note is in each section, there's a bold section. Uh, there's a bold checklist item. So if you look under water, there's quarterly leak checks. These are some of the low hanging fruit that we think is a minimum that you should be doing. So quarterly leak checks, that, that's kind of really obvious. You know, if you see a leak in your facility, you're going to fix it. A way that we want to make it more formal is just, you know, having a, a checklist or, you know, writing it down, logging when you notice leaks, or just logging when you do walkthroughs of your facility looking for leaks. So they're very uh, easy to achieve uh, mandatory items. Again, you know, we have an energy sourcing, so we cover uh, locally sourced packaged materials. And because, you know, we don't have a lot of packaging producers, we're keeping this to uh, within 500 miles of your facility. Locally sourced, we like to say you have to at least produce one product that's made with at least 50% of locally sourced ingredients. This does not include water. So if you're making beer, it has to be, you know, your grain and your hops, or if it's wine, grapes, things like that. Uh, and then we have the section for community involvement. So it's whether whether you're giving back to the community, you're hosting pickup for a pint, uh, cleanup activities, education activities, or charitable contributions, or even providing a space for communities to meet for free. And then the last section is just maintenance. So if you have a, a maintenance plan for equipment within your facility, just to keep your equipment running efficiently. Again, reducing energy consumption for us. 
Next steps, you know, we're always trying to increase membership, so we're always looking for new members. So if anyone's ever interested in joining, feel free to reach out to me. I'll have my email at the end of these slides. Um, we're always looking for feedback from members and non-members. So if you have any ideas, concerns, uh, ways to improve the program, I love feedback. So any, any will help and I be appreciated. We're always looking for additional resources for members. So again, if you have any resources or you know of any resources, I'd love to see or hear them. Uh, we are we developed resources for home brewers and we're trying to expand upon that. So if any home brewers notice it, take a look at it, let me know what you think. And again, resources for consumers. We just rolled this web page out about a month or two ago, and uh, we're always wanting to expand upon that. Uh, we have a student internship partnership with MTSU. So every summer we take an intern. Um, if there are any uh, students in the fermentation science program at MTSU interested in an internship, reach out to me. And the, the big thing we're working on right now is value stream mapping for our members. So uh, the next slide, I think, will discuss this. So value stream mapping is, is essentially looking at every step of the process. Um, so this is a quick little example, you know, taking grain from a delivery truck, storing that grain, milling that grain. So once you get that grain, there's some kind of energy source moving that grain to your silo. Is it, whether it's an auger or forklift, things like that, how much energy does it take to move that? Uh, let's go back, let's go to milling. You know, there's an electric motor running to, to mill that grain. Well, how long is that electric motor running for to mill all your grain? So we want to look at those, those particular minute uh, portions of each step of the process. And we're doing this to, to determine where are your big uh, energy taxes or water taxes. So uh, you're, we're looking at all those inputs into this. So you know, when we go to a mash, how much gas does it take or how much electricity does it, are you using to, uh, to do your mash or your boil, things like that. Uh, whether you're running an electric motor to mix things and, and introducing gas, we want to look at all those inputs for each step of the process so we can show producers in, the, in a, a map similar to this where your biggest energy taxes are. And with those energy taxes, we can help maybe identify ways to reduce energy consumption uh, or resource consumption uh, for each of those processes. Again, I'm Mark Valencia, and thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today in this program. And I think we are ready to pass it on to Oliver, and I'm going to do a quick little intro of Oliver. So Oliver Meinhol is a technical director of the brewing division uh, for Lee Z. Loeffler. Loeffler? Uh, yep. Yes. <laughs> he studied at the University of Munich, graduated with a degree in brewing science at the Berlin Institute of Technology, where he received his second master's degree in industrial engineering. He spent seven years at the VLB Research and Teaching Institute for Brewing in Berlin as a project manager followed by seven years at the Berlin Institute of Technology as an assistant professor. He is in his current position for nine years. He is a current member of the MBAA Higher Education Committee and the vice president of the MBAA District Mid-South. So, Oliver, it's on to you now, sir. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everybody. I'm on the West Coast. That's kind of early for me, but that's okay. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the CIP, what it means, you know, got some... Um, theoretical background and how to optimize your CRP cycle, especially with the main focus then sustainability, what we just heard quite a bit from Mark in regards of, you know, saving water, saving energy, and so on. Let's start with a picture or two pictures, actually. This is a typical calandria. That's an internal heater for, you know, heating up a mesh, heating up a word boil. Um, you can see it definitely has some fouling on it. You know, we have Outside of the tubes, you would, uh, that's where the steam is in the tubes. That's where your product is going through, will be heated up. Of course, we have starch, we have proteins, um, which are part of our solution. Due to the high heat, they will basically burn and, um, to the surface. And one of the goals is to get this removed on a frequent base, because the thicker the fouling will be, um, the more energy we need to heat it up. You know, it's basically a gigantic uh, waste of energy and um, all that will have an impact on the quality of your product. Another point, which most of you have seen already when you do the fermentation, this is a picture of an upper part of a fermenter where you can see the spray ball. In this case, it's actually a rotary jet. Um, you can see where the liquid 
level or the liquid surface used to be. Basically, everything below the walls of the tank seemed to be pretty nice and clean. But above, you have quite a bit of fouling of the yeast, of the foam, proteins, and so on. Although the pipe coming down from the top of the tank with a spray ball on it is, you know, was submerged. So all this needs to be cleaned, um, first of all, to have not a recontamination in case there is a contamination. Second, all the dirt can be a good harboring place for microbes, which we don't want to have in our product. So it's not only that we um, optimize the process and from the energetic or from the sustainability point of view, but also that the product keeps on being the same quality. So CIP, what does it stand for? Cleaning in place. That means it's a defined system or method to clean all your equipment um, without actually taking the whole thing apart and, you know, soak it in buckets and trash. So you keep all the equipment in place. You just do minor changes depending on the size of your um, facility. Um, mostly this type is used to do all the internal cleaning, you know, all the pipes, all the tanks, all the uh, mesh tons, the loader tons, and so on. And sometimes you just add a few more items to it, you should include into the CIP cycle to get them cleaned. Um, one reason is that we don't do it with major modifications that um, saves time, that's safe for the um, actual the person who's doing it. And the liquid comes out of a big tank or will be filled in the tank and then pumps circulated through the whole system. Big vessels will be then uh, a spray ball but everything else will be basically just pumped through. The big, big plus for this is a very consistent, you know, if you have a CAP system, you always have the same concentrations, especially if it's automatically controlled. It's very economically, you know, for you, because you um, you always use the same amount of chemicals, you always use the same amount of water. And it's very safe because you have a pretty good separation of the actual person performing the cleaning versus the, um, the material, the chemicals, which are hazardous. Um, a few pictures, the left one, the colored one, that would be a pretty big CRP system, probably for a larger facility. You can see actually nine tanks of different chemicals you can store there. Um, all the piping basically enables you to run multiple cycles at the same time. The bottom right one is a smaller CRP system, which you see quite often in smaller facilities of breweries, distilleries, etc. Um, but the idea is that you have a holding tank, let's say for caustic, for an acid, or for hot water. Um, and then you recover it, basically re come it back and store it until you do the next cycle. You can reuse them depending on the soil load. And on the upper picture is a little valve block. This just to give you an idea how automatic valves nowadays can actually um, run the traffic of the different liquids to large piping systems. Um, and if you go to really big facilities, some of these valve blocks can have like six, eight hundred of these individual valves in there. Um, the opposite, more outdated, but still very important, is the COP, cleaning out of place. Um, it's basically the opposite of CAP. You know, everything is manually. Mostly you take things apart. When you run a CAP through a tank, mostly you take some stuff off, like a carp stone or a sample valve. Those parts are mostly then stored in a separate bucket, soaked there, but then you apply a lot of manual labor to that. Um, or even you have to break it down in further smaller pieces to make it even cleanable. Um, in other words, you do a lot of modifications to it um, to get it actually clean. Um, even so, you have a CRP system. Every now and then, you should look more in a deep clean for a COP. Um, you know, take a heat exchanger, for example, take it apart, take a look inside what's going on. Um, the problem with CRP, COPs is it's pretty inconsistent. Everybody does it differently. Everybody has a different you know, feeling for volumes, different feeling of times, different feeling of applying pressure. Um, it's very time consuming because you have to take every piece in your hand. Every piece needs extra uh, attention to it. And you're very close with the chemicals. Of course, we always tell people, please wear all your proper PPEs. Two pictures of a COP nowadays. Overshare would be, you know, not really happy to see things like this without having all the proper you know, permits and the regulatory is fulfilled. The right thing is a big lot of ton, but in the old days, people actually had to crawl in there and do a lot of mechanical cleaning inside. On the left side, it's an old horizontal tank, which needs to be cleaned. You can actually see on the upper part, the you know, the Krausen ring. Um, actually, when I started my career in the late 80s, I was still crawling into these big horizontal fermenters, pushed out the yeast and did the pre-cleaning before then the CAP started. 
Um, of course, we always made sure that the CO2 was replaced by air, and somebody was standing outside and making sure that in, say, in case something happens, I will be helped. Um, how does actually the cleaning work? Um, so we have basically four steps, how to remove soil from the surface of a tank, of a vessel, and so on. So the first thing we do is we transport a cleaning solution. So we make up a cleaning solution, we take water, we add a caustic, and we mix it up, and then we basically, through a pump system, through a spray ball, we bring it actually to the soil. The next step is that a chemical reaction and a physical process takes in place. Um, so the chemicals will start working on the different bondages, let's say a peptide bond in the proteins, and the physical processes, the heat or the impingement from the water, will start loosening up the dirt. Um, of course, the cleaning solution has competitors. So if you have a lot of hard water, you know, the hard water constituents will basically kind of battle about the chemicals. So that's a very important. And then the convective and diffusive transportation of the cleaning agent into the soil. So um, what you try to do is with certain additives to the caustic, for example, you will reduce significantly the surface tension or the viscosity, which makes it easier for the liquid to penetrate, you know, small cracks and crevices and start dissolving the dirt over from more angles. Um, then, of course, we try to wetten or actually soak up the whole, uh, the whole soil load. So the deeper the liquid with the chemicals penetrates, the more actually um, we get this chemical reaction going. Um, and, of course, like I said, the physical part. Once all this is done, all the, 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 chem, uh, the material is kind of loosened up, we start actually ruling the soil from the surface. So I will show you a picture later on of a tank. Um, the idea is that you have a closed curtain of liquid running down the tank wall, and this closed curtain will be able to remove the loosened dirt in them from the mechanical point of view. Um, very important at the end is that we want to have additives in the chemicals which prevent any redeposition. In other words, once everything is in the liquid and the liquid is going through the pipes, going back to the big CAP system, hopefully you have a strainer before it goes back into the tank so you can actually sieve out the big particles. Um, you want to make sure that all these particles which were dissolved from the tank wall are now kind of captured and cannot really settle out and basically just create another soil film someplace else. Um, we have four pa um, parameters which basically will impact our cleaning, that's the chemical, so in other words, how well the chemical is developed, how well it's engineered, built, and how strong we are taking it. The next one is the mechanical energy. You know, do we have just a spray ball where we just spray easy and soft the liquid to the, uh, the walls, or do we have a real jet where we have a lot of impingement, a lot of energy in addition to the chemical part removing the soil? Temperature, of course, is very important. All we know, some area, some type of chemicals work much better at higher temperatures, or the other um, physical properties will change with temperature increase. Um, the beauty is the surface tension and the viscosity will decrease, so it will be easier for us to get the liquid into the soil. And last but not least, time is very important. We all know in the old days, you know, your laundry or your dishwasher at home ran maybe for 15, 20 minutes. Nowadays, some of these cycles take two, two and a half hours. But time is a very good point um, of cleaning, if you're not under time pressure, of course, by saving a lot of energy in, you know, at colder temperatures by saving chemicals, by less chemical, and so on. So in other words, these four parameters are interchangeable, and depending on your schedule, depending on what's your most favored pressuring factor, you can adjust it. Um, a kind of a simple formula is the cleaning result is basically a combination of the chemistry, of the mechanics, of the time, and of the temperature. And that should be always kind of constant. That's why a, a CRP system nowadays is pretty well programmed. So you have always the right temperature of your chemicals. You always have the right concentration, mostly controlled by a conductivity probe. Um, also, then the pump runs at the same speed because the spray balls need a certain pressure and a certain flow rate. If you exceed it, um, you will actually counter this whole process. You squeeze the liquid through the little openings of a spray ball and you create a mist so you don't actually get the liquid and the chemicals to the wall anymore. Um, if you don't turn up the pump high enough, 
it won't even reach the liquid. It just drips down like a shower. So that's very important that all these factors are set constantly. Um, like I said, the mechanical part is kind of given from the from the beginning. There's not much you can do, but you know you can play with chemistry, you can play with the time, and you can play with the temperature. Um, a little bit from the theory. So we have a tank wall, which is the blue horizontal line on the bottom, and there's soil packed on this wall, and there are certain adhesive forces which hold the soil on the wall. Um, of course, what we need to do is we have to overcome this energy, these adhesive forces, by applying a mechanical force, a thermal force, and a chemical force. And the equation you saw before, that's basically the idea. With all these combined forces, we overcome the adhesive force, and that's how we basically remove the soil from the tank wall. Um, other very important parts, which uh, some actually are from the beginning when you plan a new facility, have a big impact on the cleaning side. So, for example, equipment parameters, system parameters, or operational parameters. Equipment um, is basically determined by the manufacturer and what you purchase, you know, what do you spec out, what are you looking for. So, um, it's very important that you have a good design. Um, and important is that you try to eliminate everything which doesn't have to be there. You know, you make it extremely smooth, you make it extremely simple to clean, don't have anything built in which can create a spray shutter, don't have any pipes sticking out which can be considered as dead legs. Basically, there's a big term out called hygienic design. Um, it's another topic I could talk for two hours about it at least, but when you plan something, make sure um, you take these hygienic design features into consideration. Also very important is what type of materials are you using. You know, first of all, you want to have a material which is food grade, you want to have a material which the cleaning solutions can withstand, and you want to have a material which you can treat in a way that your process works well. So stainless steel nowadays is one of the key elements or the key materials um, done. But if you treat them properly, in other words, you make a very smooth surface, and especially with stainless steel, passivation is a very important process. That will help you to have conditions which makes, first of all, the adhesive forces of the soil to the wall reduced, and that helps you in cleaning, saving energy, saving chemicals, and water, and so on. So the equipment parameters is everything which you should take in consideration when you buy new equipment, when you look for this, when you plan something. That helps you a lot. Um, I said this, okay, high chemical compatibility, very important. If, you know, spirit stills are a little bit more tricky because there's quite a bit of copper involved. Um, copper is more like a soft metal, which some of these corrosive liquids, you know, start chewing up. Um, there are additives for caustic to make the caustic copper inhibitive, so you can do a good clean. And certain acids at a low concentration are also good. But there's a little limitation. You cannot really do it like you would do in stainless steel. But uh, with the help of certain, you know, materials and how you polish them, how you prepare them for your application, it will help a lot to reduce the binding forces of the dirt. So basically, when you plan something, a brewery, a distillery, and so on, um, always keep an eye on an optimal sanitation of the whole equipment. Because every time it's clean, you will have the same conditions. You can run the same process, you will get the same quality of product, and you also save a lot of energy and other materials like water. System parameters, that's more like than doing the process itself. Um, let's start with the chemical composition. How much quality are you making a very thick mesh? Are you making a thin mesh? Are you making a strong beer uh, or a very light beer? Of course, that has a big impact how much soil buildup you're going to have. Um, and how much material actually will be stick there, which you have to remove. How often do you sanitize? I mean, I get often asked this question. It's very tough to say. Like I said, if you have a brew schedule with different type of um, batches of beer, um, you know, if you have some light beers, maybe you can do X amount of runs with no cleaning. And if you do some really heavy IPAs with a lot of uh, specialty malt in it, maybe then you have to do more frequent um, cleaning. Um, the sort of cleaning solution. Okay, when you recuperate the chemicals, um, you, of course the chemical will start changing color, it will get darker, the darker you will have an accumulation of soil at the bottom. Um, sometimes it's um, 
advantageous to kind of let this kind of pour off to kind of clean up a little bit. Like I mentioned before, if you install a strainer, that removes a lot of, um, of the bigger particles, but that also helps you to kind of give an idea how often you have to actually really dump the whole cleaning solution and make a fresh one. Um, the process water, the quality is very important, especially with the hardness. Um, I mentioned that before too, the hardness has the biggest impact on the caustic of cleaning, competing with the soil basically. So if you have the possibility to use softened water or if you have soft water from the beginning on, that would be advantageous. Um, another very interesting part is where's the brewery located? You know, I'm traveling the whole North America. I've been to the southern states, Texas, Florida, where you have a high temperature and a lot of humidity. When you go up to Montana, where basically humidity is unknown because there's, you know, if you're lucky, 10%, um, that makes a complete different um, cleaning, especially when you talk about the COP, the outside cleaning, you know, mold build up. In Montana, they don't know what mold is, you know, but down in Florida, you can actually watch how mold grows. So, and then, of course, the CAP equipment. Do you have a very small system? Do you have a big system? How much automation is in there? So there are all kinds of factors which help you to improve your actually cleaning. Many, many years ago, a German guy by the name Sinner actually came up with this simple um, circle um, and said, okay, we put four pie shapes in it. It's the time mechanics, concentration, temperature. We've been talked about this already. Um, and then you can say if you make one of these pies larger, let's say for example the time, make the time larger, um, you can reduce another one. So maybe you can reduce the temperature or you can reduce the amount of chemicals being used. So this is actually a little nice tool to visualize how can I kind of play around, how can I interchange with these four factors in, um, basically impacting our cleaning. Temperature also depends a little bit what kind of soil do we have. If you look at you know, I just mentioned for um, soils, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, and minerals. So a higher temperature has always a good effect in cleaning it. Proteins is a little bit reduced. Keep in mind, if you have large proteins, heat can denature them. They can restructure. Maybe that in the opposite way, it might be harder to clean and so on. But a very interesting rule of thumb is if you increase the temperature by 10 C, about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, you double the speed of a chemical reaction. So theoretically spoken, when you clean and you increase the temperature by 10 C and you clean normally 30 minutes, you can cut it down to 15 minutes. I mean, this is theoretically spoken. It's not always the case, but kind of as an idea. Um, and not every chemical has advantages if, or it has an advantage if you increase the temperature. But for the caustic, definitely plays a big important role. Um, just increasing the temperature will significantly improving your cleaning. The time, it, it's very important. We all know that, um, you know, time is money. So um, what kind of process equipment are we dealing with? You know, is it a simple tank? Is it like a big lot of time where we have a lot of built-in materials where we need longer time to get it clean? What type of process is, you know, that's very important. How long the step is, you know, the duration of each process step. You know, sometimes you run it for 10 minutes and other times you run it for 20 minutes or even longer. Um, of course, the temperature, I mentioned that before, you have a very big impact on the cleaning. Um, you know, the higher the temperature, you can shorten it. And of course, if you say, um, I want to rather, um, I don't want to, you know, make so much um, time, I just increase my concentration of the chemicals to also compensate for the shorter time. So time is a very easy way to manipulate. Um, and mostly when I go to customers and ask them, so what's your most pressuring parameter? It's time, you know, I need to get the tank clean within 90 or 120 minutes because my next batch of work is already sitting there waiting to get in the tank for the next fermentation. So time can be a very important topic. Mechanics, I mentioned it before. Mechanics, you can't really do much because it's pretty much given, especially if you have a static spray ball. But if you look at a typical tank here, you know, you have three sections. You have the dome, you have the cylinder, and you have at the bottom the cone. Um, the idea is when you have a spray ball here in the upper center, you want to actually get the liquid on the wall. And the idea is to have a closed curtain of liquid running down on the inside of the walls and should have about a two millimeter film thickness. Two millimeters is about a tenth of an inch. Um, this is very important because you want to make sure that all the soil gets touched, that you bring actually the chemical to the soil, 
And then when the, the curtain of water keeps on, or the cleaning solution keeps on running, um, that mechanical action will remove the soil. If you open a tank after cleaning and you still see spots, there's a simple quick test you can do just to see what was the problem or what could have been the issue. If you just wipe it and the dirt gets easily removed by just wiping it with a piece of cloth, um, that tells me the chemical went there, dissolved it, made it loose, but we didn't have enough a mechanical action to get it removed. If you can't easy wipe it off, then we have basically the problem that we didn't even get enough chemical there to kind of loosen it up. So basically in these cases, coming back will be mostly a mechanical issue. Either the spray ball is clogged or the pump wasn't set to the right um, speed and so on. But just as a quick indicator where you can get it and then um, we can look into this, what could be the potential cause for this. Spray balls, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, functions, you know, I mean, the majority of the spray balls I see in the brewing industry is the left one, the 360, because you either want to have a vertical spray up, um, cleaning the, the pipe itself where the spray ball is attached, because mostly the tanks will be completely filled with the liquid and a foam cover on top. You know, sometimes you can see when you walk through the fermentation cellars that there is actually some foam, some yeast coming out of the the venting pipe that tells me that the whole tank is filled. And the picture I've showed you at the beginning, um, you know, that's where actually the majority of the dirt is. So you want to have a spray ball which really goes up into the dome and cleans all the stuff. Um, other shapes, you know, depending if, for example, uh, 180 down might be a good idea um, for those who have an open fermenter. So um, I just talked to another distillery with open fermenters and I said, uh, don't you just put a bridge over, which you can actually move, attach a, a short piece of pipe with a spray ball, 180 down, and then you can actually clean the whole tank without having actually the liquid spraying out. In the worst case, um, get a tart with a rubber band around reasons, but this way you have a very nice CAP even for an open fermenter. Mechanics, that's a little bit more, you know, scientific. I don't want to go too deep into the whole topic, but I just want to give you a few terms. Um, you might have heard, um, or you will hear it now for the first time, there's a so-called Reynolds number, and then the flow can be differentiated between a laminar flow and a turbulent flow. And the Reynolds number actually can give you an idea um, in which area we are. So if you have a liquid running or flowing through a pipe at a low speed, uh, most likely we have a laminary flow, which we don't really appreciate because you can see um, these arrows basically tell you the different speeds if you kind of cut up the liquid level in indefinite amounts. And the first layer at the tank will actually have a speed of zero. So there's no mechanical action. Nothing will really work there. If you turn up the pump and the speed starts increasing, um, then we get a turbulent flow. In other words, we have all kinds of vortexes inside, and that basically give, provides all the mechanical action to the tank wall. Um, just uh, for those who would like to look deeper into this, you know, here are all the factors which basically determine the cold Reynolds numbers. Um, most of the stuff is given, you know, the viscosity is given, the pipe diameter is given, and so on. The only thing where you really can play with is, you know, turning up and down the pump, so increasing the speed of the liquid going through the pipe. And I want to just give you a, a kind of an indicator. If you have a possibility with a flow meter to kind of get the speed and you punch these numbers in, um, we want to have at least a Reynolds number of about 4,000 and higher um, because that's basically ensuring a turbulent flow. If you go lower, um, you have a transition section between 2,100 and 4,000 um, where it can be laminar, it can be turbulent, kind of blend and so on. But if you're below 2,100, then you definitely have a laminary flow on this. I will show you a picture in a second, the difference from the cleaning perspective. Um, what happens if you have a change in diameter? You know, the flow rate will significantly change. So especially if the pipe widens up because the flow volume is the same, but of course the, it's wider, so we don't have the speed anymore. And just as an indicator, so DN80 and DN100 is a metric term. 
So this is 80 millimeters worth of 100 millimeters. 80 millimeters is a little bit more than three inches, and 100 millimeters is about four inches. If you just increase the pipe, your speed will reduce from original two meters per second, which is like six foot eight, um, down to 1.25 meters per second, which is about four feet per second. So you will see a significant decrease in the speed. And when you when you're actually already pretty close here on the edge of uh, you know between the transition and turbulent flow, um, and then you drop down, might just easily go into the laminar flow, and then your pipe doesn't get cleaned anymore. And here's a picture of the identical pipe. You know we did some trials with it, and the left one is when we didn't have enough flow speed. You know the velocity was not enough, didn't get clean, and then we just turned up the pump and repeated the trial, and you can see. The pipe is now nice, clean, and shiny. So this is very important because quite often a mechanical issue um, is the problem, not anything else. Um, but I, we get called quite often, hey, we don't get it clean, can I sort us out? And the majority is a mechanical issue. Oops, sorry, that was too fast. Chemicals. You know, every, we have different chemicals in the distilling spirit and so on because each chemical has a different impact on what type of soil we're talking about. Um, the, the, the major differentiation is caustic is good for organic soil, acid is good for inorganic soil. You have a little bit of a transition in there in between, but if you look at the first ones, um, proteins, fats, they are very good dissolvable by caustic, whereas water, not really good. I mean, we all know um, they don't really blend well at all. Acid has more a medium impact. And if you go down to minerals, for example, Water has a medium impact, but acid a very good one. So um, that's why we got often clean first with a caustic to remove all the organic soil, and then we run an acid cycle to remove a little bit of the inorganics, which might be from the water, which might be from the raw materials we applied. Um, quite often, we actually recommend um, that we don't have to run an acid cycle every time. So another point of saving water, energy, time, and chemicals. Um, it depends a little bit on your conditions. You know, some breweries apply an acid cycle every three CIP cycles, others every five, and so on. Um, but that's something which you have to determine by yourself for individual cases. Um, of course, all these is depending on the soil level, what type of process you're using, the time and temperature. So you can play a lot with this, and you can actually optimize it to your schedules to your needs and of course nowadays also to your uh, you know from the uh, sustainability perspective you know what's the most environmentally friendly or the most cost effective one for you um the quality of the water you know hardness ph etc um has a big impact on it biological what does the water come with i mean ideally you don't want to have much in the water but you know there are you know some microorganisms in there and so, especially when you look at the sanitation cycle later on, after the cleaning, um, the water chemistry is a very important um, property. Pre-rinsing, um, that's very important uh, because we don't know add too much soil to the caustic or to the acid. So we do recommend a few burst rinses up front. Just to remove all the loose dirt, everything which just can be removed by just applying a hose with water or a spray bowl with water, all the loose dirt will be just flushed out. We normally use, recommend three burst rinses for each one, two, three minutes. Shouldn't take longer than 10 minutes. But, you know, it's depending on the type of water available and so on, the pressure and so on. Uh, we recommend using more ambient temperatures. Others use hot. Um, keep in mind, the hotter the water you do, you start changing the chemical properties, for example, especially with proteins, and you might heat up the surface and actually start baking on your soil more to the surface. Um, chemical cleaning, you know, most critical is water hardness, very important, and rinsing, that's all important. You know, you want to rinse out all the chemistry before you go to the next step. Um, so that is important, especially if you do the final rinse with water. Um, the water quality is a very important thing. Um, if you use sanitizers afterwards, the beauty nowadays is that there are a lot of uh, so-called EPA registered sanitizers, which are considered as non-rinse sanitizers. So if you let then the tank run empty and basically dry it, um, you don't have to rinse out any 
remaining sanitizers because these are ruled by the EPA. If you look on your EPA registered label of your product, um, if you follow the proper concentrations, then everything is safe. A typical CRP program, you know, um, first we start with the water rinse, ambient temperature, two, five minutes, 10 minutes, basically depending on, you know, the soil load you have, how much loose dirt you have in. Um, some people just go visually when they see that the water coming out is starting getting clean and clear, and then you can stop it. This is water which I would always recommend going directly to the drain. Then we start with caustic, 2%. And that's the only chemical where we recommend going high in temperatures, you know, between 160, 180 degrees in this range. And then depending on the soil load, you know, this can change from five to 30 minutes. This can be re recovered in a tank. Then we do a uh, water rinse for one to five minutes. We just want to make sure that all the caustic is removed. Because when you start with your acid rinse, the caustic um, will be, uh, the acid will be neutralized and then you don't have any cleaning effect on that. Um, acid, we normally recommend a very low concentration because the amount of inorganics is very small, so it's not really um, such a big deal to do. But you want to remove it because the more soil builds up, you know, that's um, dirt, and dirt can harbor microorganisms, and this is then for your next process not really beneficial. You recirculate it, you collect it again, and then you do another water rinse to get the acid out. Um, that can go to the drain, and then at the end you do your sanitizing step. Um, most nowadays, um, I'm sure most of you know this is persidic acid. Um, I mentioned here to the drain, yes, but you can also, if you have the possibility, if your CRP system is actually able to collect that, not as a new sanitizing step, because you should not use a sanitizer twice, but this water could be actually used for the pre rinse So actually, the collected water from point 0.6 can be actually used for point 0.1 for the next cleaning step. So that's another way to save, you know, water and chemistry. Um, what can we do to improve the cleaning, to make it even more effective, to reduce the chemical usage, to reduce the temperature and so on? Um, oxidative cleaning, um, that's a very common thing nowadays. We have various compounds which we can nowadays add to the caustic to improve the cleaning effect. Um, the first one, sodium hypochlorite, or basically everybody knows it as bleach, um, is a very good additive, but I highly recommend only using it really, really, if it's necessary, I would not recommend it. I would try to stay away from any chlorinated product um, for multiple reasons. One is, um, if you don't rinse it properly at the end, chlorine can actually start, you know, turning to chlorides and starts pitting your stainless. So you actually have physical damage to your equipment. Second, if somebody else is working close by with an acid and it gets in contact with the chlorine, you create chlorine gas. That's not a good thing. So definitely avoid chlorine. I know it's a cheap cleaner, it's a very good cleaner, but you know, only if it's really, really necessary. Hydrogen peroxide nowadays is actually the go-to material. Uh, once you made up your caustic solution, you add you know half percent by volume of hydrogen peroxide to this and you will see a significant improving. So you can actually dial down the time, you can dial down a little bit of the caustic concentration and let the hydrogen peroxide do its job. The hydrogen peroxide is basically an oxidizer. Um, it's, it's, some people describe it as the scrubbing bubbles. So in other words, it penetrates and breaks it up and immediately opens up the cracks and crevices for faster access of your caustic. Um, we had cases where we were able to cut down the 90-minute cycle to 35 minutes. So a lot of time savings. Carburate, percarbonate, these are additives which you find more often in dry, um, non-caustic and basic and alkaline cleaners, also as an oxidative cleaner um, to make it more efficient. But um, I would say the hydrogen peroxide nowadays is the go-to for improving the caustic cleaning. Um, so basically what they all do, they split off an oxygen, active oxygen, and that basically this kind of splitting it off, this reaction is actually more like a physical, like the mid, little micro explosions, which actually open up the, the pores, the cracks to, for the cleaning. Um, in this case, what does it help? You know, the soil wetting and penetration goes faster. You have a faster removal of it. Um, because you run this on a shorter time, you have less corrosion. 
I mean, unless you use a chlorinated product. Um, you can use it up to a temperature of 160, 180 F, but also you can actually dial down some of the temperature if you don't want to use so much um, energy and less manual scrubbing. So there are many advantages to using um, uh, oxidative booster for your caustic cleaning. Sanitizers, these are basically very important. At the end, you know, everything is clean. Um, you still want to make sure, especially in the cold side where microorganisms are a very important thing, um, that the sanitizer are properly applied and only applied if everything is clean because you cannot sanitize a dirty surface. It makes no sense. Sanitizers itself, um, what happens, the remaining soil will protect the microorganism and basically they can harbor, the sanitizer doesn't get contact to it, so they won't be killed. Um, so those who will not be killed can then start actually growing again and spoiling your next product. The beauty of beer, for example, especially this beer, is because we have very low pH and the conditions of the beer with alcohol and everything, there are no pathogenic germs which can grow in beer. So beer is actually safe. In the Middle Ages, actually, people drank beer versus water because the water was by far not as good in quality and safe to drink. Um, if somebody feels bad after beer, it's basically had too much of it. It's not like there was any contamination in it which made you sick. When we sanitize, we basically can differentiate between two methods. One is the thermal sanitation, the other one is the chemical sanitation. The thermal sanitation is actually, oops, I will show this. But the thermal sanitation is um, basically heating it up for those who have a laboratory with an autoclave, for example. That's how you do it. You, you apply a lot of heat to destroy all the cells at a certain temperature for a certain time. The chemical sanitation is the beauty nowadays is that the um, you don't need time, uh, you don't need temperature because you can do it ambient temperature. Uh, you are added to the water, let it run for 10, 15 minutes, and you're good to go. Let it drain and you, you are safe. Um, the thermal sanitation also has a lot of thermal stress on the equipment, you know, because of the big di temperature differences. Um, that's another reason I would kind of, you know, stay away from this, especially if you have big equipment, you know, it's a very high amount of energy you have to put in there. Um, if we look at chemical sanitation, there are all kinds of sanitizers out there. Um, some sanitizers actually don't kill the microorganism, they just inhibit certain functions of the cell. Um, these microorganisms are pretty smart. They can actually find a way around so they get used to it. Um, other sanitizers are actually physically destroying. You know, they're just breaking open the cell while they're destroying. So this type of cells are not able to get used to it. Nowadays, the PA is, I think, in, especially in the beverage and beer industry, the number one a sanitizer. The beauty is when we talk about so-called non rinse sanitizers, the PA breaks down to acetic acid to water, CO2, oxygen, and these are all naturally occurring chemicals in your beer. So even acetic acid is a common, is the most common fermentation byproduct in your beer, so you don't have to worry about anything. Of course, people say, hey, how about the oxygen, you know, does it stay? Yes, it can do it, but if you really have the tank run dry and you have a few droplets, and these droplets had originally maybe a concentration of 200 ppm of PAA, the amount of oxygen remaining, you won't even be able to measure it. So I can assure you, there's no problem. As a final thing nowadays, um, I don't know, Mark, are you able to play this movie? That's a little movie, actually. Yeah, let me let me share my screen, um, and it should be able to uh, to play okay. this. So I just want to give you a, a quick, you know, final for this presentation. Um, when you when you have a tank and you clean it, make sure that all the CO2 is gone because the CO2 and caustic, when it gets in, neutralizes and the pressure suddenly decreases, basically down to zero, and that's when tanks collapse. This was actually done on purpose for presentation purposes, um, but you can clearly see the force behind it. So two things why a tank can collapse is one is significant pressure decrease by neutralizing CO2. The other one is if you have, you know, you ran a hot caustic and then you start spraying in with very cold water, you have a sudden temperature decrease, that all that means you have a sudden pressure decrease. And even big tanks, you know, they look sturdy, you know, strong, but at the end they are as 
weak as a little Coke can, and you easily can squeeze them. That's actually from my side to everything. Um, this is basically what Mark told you. It's a little bit about me. This is the company, Silöffler, a few information about this, and uh, information about my contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me now. Thank you so much, Oliver, for that. Uh, we have a couple questions that came in. Let me pull those. Let's see here. Um, so here's a question that says, are there any general rules to identify ways to reduce chemical and water use in CIP processes? So I, I guess maybe just rules, rules of hand or the, the most general ones if somebody's trying to, to figure out how they can reduce chemical or water use, what, what's like the... The, the, big, the biggest um, is saving by um, recovering it. If you have a CRP system and there are small mobile systems out now, which are um, you know on wheels, you can wheel them from tank to tank. Um, they are in the four-digit numbers from the price point of view. They have uh, 60, 80 gallon tanks on it, and that's where you can recover it and you can use it for the second cleaning, you can use it on the third cleaning, depending on the soil load. So this is a general rule, the more you can recover your cleaning solution, um, and you more, the better you pre-rinse it, so you, the soil load going into your cleaning solution, that will basically help you most in saving water and chemistry. Uh, someone was asking um, about when you mentioned um, the hydrogen peroxide, um, can you go into, I know we're running short on time, but uh, maybe just, just a little bit more of an explanation of it, like that's, that's more of what people are using that, uh, now, or? Yes, especially on the first picture I showed you, you know, the internal heater where we have the highest fouling. The oxygen hydrogen peroxide is basically the best tool to get this quickly removed. Um, it basically just breaks apart, and this, like this cropping bugger, the physical effect of this little, I call it micro explosion will help to crack it open and speed up the cleaning process. So, like I said before, we had a case where we were able to run, uh, shorten a cycle from 90 down to 35 minutes, and, you know, that saves significant amount of energy to heat up the cores, to keep it hot, run the pump, and so on. So the hydrogen peroxide is a good booster. You can also use it on a fermenter. You know, the second picture I showed you with the big Krausen ring. If you wanna, if that's very big and you wanna save on energy and you wanna save on chemistry, add a little bit of, of the caustic side, add a little bit of this hydrogen peroxide, and your cleaning result will significantly improve. There's one little thing you have to keep in mind, um, because it's degassing or off-gassing, uh, make sure you have enough liquid so the pump doesn't cavitate. But I, it's, it's nowadays one of the most common additives we have to improve the cleaning and, you know, actually from the sustainability point of view, reduce the time, reduce the energy. Awesome. Well, Oliver, I don't see anything, uh, any other questions as of right now. If anybody, um, you know, is having lunch later or, or dinner and is like, oh, my gosh, I wish I would have asked this question, uh, feel free to um, reach out to, um, you had Mark's uh, email earlier. Um, he, he's the, the contact with all of our Tennessee Sustainable Spirits program. And then, of course, uh, as you're seeing on the screen right there, Oliver's uh, email is there, and I'm sure he would be happy to, to answer any type of questions that you might have about about the uh, the presentation. First off, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to you, Oliver, and Mark for, for speaking and taking time out of your schedules. And then also I wanted to um, give a big thank you to everyone that registered and was part of the webinar audience. Uh, it's very important that, that we've got an audience to, uh, to present to. So this webinar recording will also uh, be available on our website and uh, will be sent out uh, with a follow-up email, um, probably the start of next week. Um, and like I said, if you have any other further questions about the, the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits program uh, or something that was mentioned in this presentation, feel free to reach out to Mark, um, and that is mark.valencia at tn.gov. Um, with, that, with that being said, everyone have a great rest of your day, and, and thanks for uh, for joining us. Thank you.